So uh, yeah, I think we should get started in the, in um, two minutes. Um, tell me, Patrick, uh, do you have a uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to present your, uh, a deck? Do you want to do a collaborative uh, um, uh, jam? What's your how, how do you see this? Yeah, so I didn't like prepare any materials beforehand. I think it'd probably be best just to like talk and ask questions, and then yeah, like again, kind of just share experience. Um, if that's okay. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to go. Um, we've been using a uh, fig jam. I think. Do you have? Can you share the link in the chat, um, Ellie? Yep. So the links in there. I can share my screen. And take collective notes as we chat, but everybody can add any notes that you would like. Nice. Perfect. Great. So I took a cool screenshot just a couple of minutes ago of a bounty on Research Hub, and I'm just going to post it here. Nice. Yeah, so um, so where to start? <laughs> There's so many angles we can take this. Um, yeah, I would love to 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 hear your experience in general, how the experience started, what type of activity you've been seeing. What are the difficulties and what are like the product challenges, but also like the social challenges around that? I, you know, happy to just have a fluid conversation around all of these different angles. Yeah, totally. So uh, maybe it makes sense to help set context of like where I'm coming from and like why I think like tokenization is important when building like a, a product for science. Um, so yeah, my background, um, I am a double dropout once from a PhD program in molecular biology, and then again uh, from medical school. Um, when I was in my PhD program, it became fairly obvious to me that financial incentives kind of dictated a lot of the average academic's uh, behavior. Something like 1% of first, this is in the States, so it might be a little bit different in Europe, but 1% of first year PhD students end up becoming research professors. So there's this hyper competitive environment where you kind of have to do anything you can in order to just have a chance at like um, having a career within academia. Um, the way that success within science is judged is based on bibliometrics. So how often do you publish and how many citations do those publications create? Um, and so again, when 99% of people are funneled out of a career, you have to do basically anything you can in order to get into that top 1%. And the most tried and true kind of like evidence-based method of getting there is by maximizing your publications and maximizing your citations. So um, there are all kinds of like not great behaviors that result as a downstream kind of effect of that financial pressure. And so to me, when I was like in kind of my academic career, it was like, wow, money dictates a lot of these decisions of people who are like very altruistically motivated, but they have to kind of abide by this like weird metric structure in order to just have a chance to do what they love. And so in my mind, um, I thought like a, a better system would be like recognizing that we're all humans, like we all need money, we all have our own personal financial incentives. And um, like using that for the advantage of the ecosystem as a whole. And so basically creating custom financial incentives to encourage healthy research behaviors. And that's kind of like the big picture goal of Research Hub is to create a place where people can like participate within the global scientific community and earn tokens for doing so with the like most difficult part being like, how do we award tokens in a way that actually create healthier research behaviors? And I don't even know if we're at the point where we have the answer to that yet, but that's what we're kind of hoping to build over the course of the next 10 to 20 years is like a, like a democratic way for the world to get together in an organized fashion and decide what we value as a community and reward, you know, with financial incentives the behaviors that we think will help to progress like the world's ability to create new knowledge forward. So that's why I think tokens are a great tool for a scientific product that's trying to address this problem because they give you the ability to do like financial engineering, you know, for lack of a better term, 
where you can kind of experiment with different financial incentives in the real world, see like what behaviors they elicit and kind of iterate on them over time in order to get to a place where in theory, um, you're helping to encourage healthy research behaviors. And so like, just to, like, I was thinking about this talk beforehand. Um, and like one of the big picture, I think struggles that might be a little, I, although you can totally see it on our website today, like half the content is spam, <laughs> like, like it's very easy for us to, um, kind of sit here and talk about financial incentives and be like, oh, hey, yeah, if you pay people for replicating studies, you know, you're going to have better science because you'll have more replications. But that's not how it works in the real world. There are people, you know, on the internet who like basically yeah. take advantage of earning opportunities, you know, oh, yeah. in any way they can. And so um, I guess like there's a difficult balance between like trying to build a system that actually causes these you know healthy research behaviors and also like mitigating unintended um you know consequences of creating a financial incentive structure because people you know are humans and will try and do anything they can to earn money typically yeah yeah but the the, the bright thing about that is is when you think about the entire space of possibilities of how new incentive models can be designed we know for a sure thing that there are better uh, uh, equilibrium is out there. There's better global maxima or local maxima than the one we're currently in. The space is so rich. And I completely agree that there's, um, sorry about that. I completely agree that there's a lot of uh, um, uh, open questions about how do we avoid things like, you know, opportunistic bounty hunters. You know, there's, there's a lot, I think, of arguments against paying peer reviewers, right, that a lot of people within the scientific communities have have uh, put forward and there's also a group of people who are for paying peer reviewers and there's been you know for for those of you who look you know want more context there's been there used to be a movement you know four hundred dollars per peer review right so there's a there's a history that goes back there's also a very interesting uh, podcast with Alison Mudd, the CEO of PLOS with a few other people and there was a can that was pro and a can that was against and they deb debated very lively you know the consequences of that right and so I think I think at the end of the day, what what is really fantastic about what you're doing also is just that we're experimenting, right? At the end, you know, we want to have an empirical uh, um, uh, approach to these things that we're building, right? And that means running small scale experiments, right? And evolving quickly because we can stay in our ivory tower, right? And make plans and incentive designs and system designs and all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't crystallize us through a product that actually elicits these types of behavior, you know, in line with the theory. Uh, and you're going to learn so much about unintended consequences of your model, right? So I think this is, there's, there's like that, a, a great like uh, merit in, in, in this approach. So I think, you know, what would be really uh, interesting is to hear more about, you know, some of the success stories where you had like really good success with bounties, you know, things that went terribly wrong, right? And like the postmortems on that, and like just kind of understanding the range of experience you've had so far uh, with this project on Research Hub. Yeah, totally. So, so I'll start off from like the very beginning. I th I think we like um, launched Research Coin on the Ethereum mainnet in August of 2020. So we've been live on or live on the mainnet now for a while, and have tried like a couple of different things. Um, sort of the first thing that we tried was very basic and didn't have a whole lot of like thinking beforehand where um, we did a million coin a week giveaway, essentially, where um, we, in theory, wanted to get some tokens out there. So we just gave a million coins away, you know, based on number of upvotes uh, per week, just to see like, hey, you know, are people motivated by earning tokens? Um, this did not work well. Uh, basically, we, we actually did get some scientists, but they were fairly low quality scientists. And a lot of the actions were uh, taken motivated by the financial incentives. So people kind of gamed our system, tried to figure out, you know, how can I make as much money as possible um, for the least amount of effort? And um, yeah, it was, I think, a resounding failure. Personally, we ended up getting like something like 300 weekly active users from it, but they were all pretty low quality to the point where I think it would be detrimental towards spreading Research Hub to like actual academic users. Um, and so I think like kind of the lesson that we learned from that is like, we have to be intentional with how um, 
incentives are designed because like just throwing tokens out there, there will be people who uh, are purely interested in financial gain. And that's their main motivation, not necessarily like helping the project grow or um, like helping to make science better. Um, the next example of something that we did, which I think was actually like pretty like well thought out beforehand and has been fairly successful is we uh, started an editor program. And so um, there was kind of like a, a centralized gate on this earning kind of feature where people applied to be editors at Research Hub. Um, we took applications, did interviews, ended up selecting PhDs who had expertise within certain fields of science. And they earned kind of like a research coin salary for uh, moderating specific hubs on Research Hub and then helping to like create content and generate conversation within those specific hubs. And, and so I, I say this was successful, but I think it was like a third successful, if I'm being honest with myself. We ended up hiring something like 50 um, PhDs in order to like help us kind of create initial content on Research Hub. Um, and these are all people who like, you know, are scientists and like, I spoke to them, you know, on a phone call, like I knew that they were real people who like, in my initial opinion, you know, were motivated to help like fix problems. And um, maybe about a third of those people were actually motivated to fix problems. And two thirds were just kind of trying to earn some tokens and earn some money. And so um this was a step forward where by creating a sort of like filtering mechanism um, where we kind of validated like talented users beforehand to become eligible for these rewards, uh, we were able to actually like get what we intended out of it instead of just giving a million coins away to anybody who gets content that's upvoted very easily gamed. You know, we put a little bit of a gate and about a third of the people we brought in were extremely talented and are still with us today, like helping to like moderate hubs, even, even more than that. Like they help us do like product ideation and like marketing. And really they do a lot of the hard startup work for us. So that way we can focus on building the product. Um, so yeah, the editor program was a step forward from like our initial million coin giveaway, but I still think like, you know, has a lot of room for improvement. Um, and then after that, I think what we've had the most success with is the bounty feature. Kind of as Chris mentioned, um, we have the ability for users to place research point bounties on specific tasks. So the use cases here are like all over the place. They range from, hey, I have a scientific question. Like uh, I, I heard you guys during one of the earlier calls, Sino was talking about red light therapy, right? And so um, Brian actually, like, I don't know if it's just like trendy in the news right now, but Brian actually posted a question like a couple of days before that, that was like, hey, you know, does red light therapy um, help for wound healing or something like that? And then he placed a bounty on it and people came in and tried to like answer that question using citations. Um, another thing that we've done is automatically assigning peer review bounties. So we have a bio archive preprint hub where uh, people can upvote preprints after a certain arbitrary number of upvotes. We automatically assign a peer review bounty to that preprint. And so in theory, what we're trying to do here is like crowdsource peer review on top of preprints um, in order to hopefully like bring value to the original authors to help improve their manuscripts. And this has actually been very successful. Um, we have a lot of people who submit like LLM generated uh, peer reviews that are really trash and we have to moderate them <laughs> you know we have to remove them because they're like really unbecoming of the website I think but um like maybe like a third of the people who submit peer reviews are actually like very well-trained scientists who do a really in-depth like prideful job of like reviewing a manuscript in a fair objective and like like with the goal of being helpful um and we've been able to uh, I think like bring in new users who are really high quality um, based on the opportunity to earn, you know, the equivalent of a hundred to two hundred dollars for taking the time to to share a peer review. Um, so like, this is probably not like the most decentralized. And I guess like one piece of context on that too is. 
there's manual control of people earning the peer review bounties. So when someone shares like a an LLM, you know, generated kind of like low effort piece of content, a, a human needs to say, this is good enough to award this bounty to. And right now that responsibility lies within the editors who have stuck around for over two years. So there's a group of humans basically determining if a piece of content is high quality enough to be, you know, awarded a bounty. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I have like a split mind where in a perfect world, this should all be automated and it should be permissionless and decentralized. But like from our experience so far, like we need a manual layer, you know, at least in the early stages while we're still kind of lean and scrappy in order to like help to bridge the gap where like a human determines if there's a quality peer review and that person earns rewards for doing so. So it's kind of like- yeah, I, I think, look, look, Patrick, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And actually it's it's uh, it's the only way to some degree, right? So like you, you need, to, the, the question is how you, how you implement this way, right? But there needs to be a human on the receiving end of the review, right? There has to be some accountability process. And you could even argue a meta accountability process on like the judge himself, right? And so I think, you know, the advantage of this approach is that you can iterate fast, right? You can iterate fast, you can test things out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I'm just to say, I think uh, we're at the time in DSI where the goal should be to run fast, small contained experiments so that we can gather data and refine the course. And I'm really glad you're leading this charge of like testing out hypothesis, right? Around the use of incentives in science. So, I mean, yeah, it's 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 really the way to do it for, from my perspective. So uh, where do you see this going now? What's your, what's your like next step on like, what, where, where do you see like going from the, these initial encouraging results just want to draw your attention that uh, even like for a PhD student, you know, even hundred dollars makes a huge difference, right? So it's actually the the capital efficiency, and here's a debate within the academic community: the capital efficiency of paying reviewers, peer, uh, re reviewers, is actually higher than a lot of people would think, right? So in many of these debates, there's a question, uh, and I can, actually I can I can pass a little piece of information here. Uh, it's from a blog that I follow. Uh, someone um, was writing the reasons why we should not pay peer reviewers, right? So maybe we can go through these yeah. and think about um, each of these points and discuss these points together and see if we find you know, the good counter arguments to these points. So a little bit of context. This is from Kent Anderson, who's uh, very much a conservative uh, um, we worked a lot within the scientific publishing industry and his perspective is open access has been a mistake because it messes up the incentives in the system. It incentivizes paper mills and it incentivizes volume over quality. And the world was before was a better place where we had subscription models that created predictable revenues and where size was a limitation to incentivize the good proper selection of articles. Okay, that, so this is his fundamental stance. Of course, because of his stance, which is essentially anti-OA, he's fairly unpopular, right? Because the 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 you know the majority opinion right now is, of course, you know that we want open access to information. Um, so, but he has very interesting takes, and this is his take on paying peer reviewers, and something we can go through. So, this is in the context of paying peer peer reviewers for journal publication. All right. So, imagine you have a you have your legitimate scientific journal and you will decide to pay your peer reviewers. And so he says uh, it would increase the price for journal publications to direct costs and the expense of managing and completing transaction, right? To cover overhead and profit, whatever journal pays would likely be recouped at 3x the cost in order to cover overhead and ensure profits. So why is there overhead? So his argument is there, because I'm looking at that and you know I would tend to think, how can the overhead be so big, right? And so his argument is that because the editor has to vouch for the quality of the reviews that are on the returning end and decide through a process that has certain legitimacy to it, whether or not the review makes the cut, given the risk that there will be opportunistic reviewer that will just be reviewing with the minimal possible acceptable standard for $100, right? And that that will create overhead on the resources. 
And that's why it's going to actually, for every dollar you would pay a peer reviewer, a journal would be expected to spend $2, right? Uh, and of course, there's one part, which is ensuring profit, which, uh, um, of course, typically in the industry, it's around 30% uh, gross margin, uh, net margins. I don't remember exactly, but it's it's pretty standard within the publishing industry. Um, it would create a new form of corruption, reviewer mills, as reviewers claim or to get paid and businesses spring up to leech money from grants, publishers, and customers. Okay. So... That's that's a, that's the idea that we'd have a whole economy spot spinning up of opportunistic reviewers, right? And we'd have fake reviewer mails with businesses that take a percentage of the transactions. So in the context of this post, he's talking about a specific service, which um, I, I should probably link, but like it's, you'll see the website, you will you will uh, <laughs> go crazy. But essentially, it's like. We have a database of reviewers. You pay us $100, we keep 40, and we pay the reviewers, and we send you back a review, right? That's the model. And that's the model that he's discussing here. Um, yeah, it would entice reviewers to accept invitations to review, even if they don't have the expertise or the time to do quality review. And I think this is a risk with all of the LLM-generated content, right, that we see now. So now we are, we're in a situation where okay, we have these motivated bounty hunters. They don't have necessarily the skills, but they'll do their best to pretend that they have, right? Using all of the AI tools out there possibly to masquerade as real experts, right? If a publisher pays for reviewers, it means paying for the review of rejected articles, which add more cost to accepted articles in order to cover the cost for those reviewed and rejected. Yes, but I think this is actually a problem with open access in general. Right. So this idea that there's an accept reject binary decision, I think this is this is wrongheaded because it is only acceptable to pay APCs when you're accepted. And that creates a, as we know it, like a, a, a big incentive problems where you have to be a mega journal, lower your standards, force your editors to accept as much volume as possible so that you don't compromise your business operations. Right. So this is a general critique. And here, essentially, again, it's a multiplier effect. Right. So we're going from $100, $300 accounting for overhead and profit to then doubling that again, because you know if you have a 50% acceptance rate or worse, we quadruple it if you have a 25% acceptance rate because it's a selective journal. Um, and finally, um, it would attract non-serious and or opportunistic people to reviewing papers, people who are only in it for a quick buck. I think here he's just repeating himself. It will not improve reviews in any meaningful way. Okay, so this is like the rebuttal. So I guess something we can we can all discuss together. Yeah, totally. Thanks for finding this. And like to be totally honest, I think there are a couple of decent points here. Um, sorry, do you mind zooming in a little bit just so I could thank you? Um, so the first point: paying reviewers would increase increase prices for journal publication. So I think they're probably right through the current like paradigm of like a kind of for-profit uh, style journal. Um, I, I guess the pushback that I would have here is that their business is not the most efficient anyway. <laughs> and so there's probably more efficient ways to like create the same value with less overhead um, using the internet. And so um, I think that this may be focusing on the wrong point and that like it, if the issue here is costs, there are low hanging fruit to improve that that don't really have anything to do with paying reviewers. It's more the infrastructure of how um, journal publications operate. For, for instance, like BioArchive, I think is doing a fantastic job of like hosting scientific content and they have a, a budget of like $2 million per year. And so somehow they're able to host scientific content, uh, remove really low quality content. It's not just anybody can post there um, and they do it, you know, fairly economically. So yeah, I, I think that uh, there are a couple of good points here, but this one feels like a distraction sort of to lead off, which is not promising, but yeah. Yeah. No. So like, I think, I think, but it, it, it's true in essence, right. It would raise costs, right. There's, there's no denying that of course. Right. I guess the question is like, 
um, there, there's a broader, there's a whole broader conversations around that, around like, what is the, 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 the points where journal provide the most value and what are the things that provide less value and how could we create a better allocations of funds towards the value, towards optimizing for the valuable parts of what they do and while disregarding the less valuable parts of what they do, right? Totally. So that's, but that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's a fascinating conversation itself. And I've been, uh, we should, we could have a whole like series of seminar on this, um, which I would love to, because I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, yeah. So like, how do we deal with reviewer mails? How do we deal with just low quality opportunistic people or people that just try to pass the minimal standard bar, right? What does it look like at the limit, right? Such a system. So that becomes uh, um, functional and that all users are satisfied with it. That, that's a question I had also for Patrick, which was that in your in those first two experiments that you were describing, you had people who were clearly only in it for the money. And the question is, can you direct that type of behavior in a positive way rather than just completely, you know, just trying to kind of suppress it or avoid it or whatever? Uh, Cause like, you know, in the, you know, economics, we have you know, this concept that's not entirely accurate, but utility maximizing agents, you know, people are just out to like, so like, what do you do about utility maximizing agents in, the, in, in this? And like, can we direct that behavior better? And also the flip side of that question is what did you find was really beneficial in retaining the people who were genuinely interested? Uh, like what, what were, what were the aspects of the, of what you were doing that got people to stick around? Yeah, totally. I love that question because like in theory, the, the way we should be thinking about the designing these incentives is not like um, whether people are doing the right or wrong thing. You know, we, we should make it valuable for everyone to do the right thing based on their own incentives. And so some of the people who are creating like low effort content, that's just like their highest ROI um, based on their skill sets. And we should like create an incentive design that like leverages them rather than encourages them to create content that's like not useful for our community. And so we haven't done this yet, but one thing I've thought about here, which I'm like pretty excited about, I have to convince the rest of my team to be excited too. So like a little bit of work there, but um, are, are you all familiar with Steemit? This is like a old school on-chain kind of Reddit tool. I love this thing. Um, it ne really didn't reach the potential that I thought it could have. But they had an interesting system where um, upvotes increase the rewards on a post. And so um, upvotes were also uh, weighted based on how early you were. So if you were the first upvote on a piece of content that ended up receiving a lot of upvotes, uh, you earned tokens for that. And so there was sort of a role there's also an opportunity cost to upvoting where you can only upvote like once a day or something like that. Um, so basically there was this role for someone who doesn't necessarily need to share like um, academic content, but their job was to basically pick what they think other people would upvote in the future and like would be interesting to others. And so even that's, you know, not the perfect incentive design, but I think it's a great example of how you can leverage um, like people without expertise in a certain subject to do something productive that ends up being useful for people with the expertise. So, so even like, if you look at like, um, like Ozempic, you know, for instance, like there are probably a lot of like papers that the average public is pretty interested in and to be able to like curate those papers in a way that experts can then direct their attention to what the average person is most interested in would be pretty useful. And so this is just like a theoretical thought experiment, right? But yeah, I think part of our job, you know, not just Research Hub Inc., but our community's job is to like figure out how we can take this potential energy of like random people on the internet who want to earn money and funnel it into healthy research behaviors which could be helping to discover new preprints that need peer review from experts more so than actually doing the peer review themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, I love this idea of the game theory that goes behind that, right? This idea that you, you need to scout early because then your rewards are, 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 will be much higher. I think this is very, very smart. I think understand, and this is a topic that Ronan really loves, it's this idea of stigmergic marks, right? This idea that we leave, we leave marks around it and these marks have a lot of value. And uh, 
a lot of the marks we create today in social media, they have only intrinsic value, right? Or, or they have value around, it, but they're not financially tied to it, right? They're tied to utility for me, like, hey, I'm bookmarking something, right? Or, hey, I could find this post again because I've liked it, right? Or I want to signal, yeah, this is good. I'm like, I'm totally with you, right? So this kind of like just pro-social element, right? Um, but I think the space is, is, is immense here. Um, I'd want to tie this in, this conversation, with a field of computer science. Computer scientists are interested in a whole lot of things, and uh, they're actually interested in psychology and game theory. And there's a whole field called peer prediction here. I linked a, a paper on this, right? Which is about how do we elicit effortful and truthful reviews from competent people, right? Which at the end of the day is, the, is, is, is your real goal, is we have to maximize around these three qualities, right? The right people to review the right paper, get them to expand effort, and get them to be truthful, meaning not express any strategic behavior like, hmm, if I upvote this, I'm not going to get the grant, therefore, you know, I'm going to shoot them down, right? This type of strategic behavior is quite common in computer science conferences where you have limited space, right, for abstract submissions. And you have reviewer rings and you have a lot of problems. A lot of this spawns from the, the very uniqueness of how computer science curates research, which is very different from the system we, we're most used to, which is where you have journals. Well, they have conferences. There's just limited speaking spots. And they have you submit an abstract. And then there's a date where everyone has to review each other's work. And people start bidding for, for the work you want to review. And you then, you know, you use a mixture of quantitative and qualitative evaluation for all of these works. And at the very end, there's a chair, just like your editors, who verifies that, the, the, who essentially has the final word, right? And so, and this is a system which is, uh, uh, which has, you know, a lot of advantages because peer review is now equally distributed amongst the participants of the conference. Very different than what we have with the current journal system, where we have these like review workhorse who answer 80% of their peer review, you know, who there's like this 20-80 split. A lot of scientists are not carrying their weight in the system. You can defect. You can just say, hey, no, I'm not reviewing, right? I'll let others review. I'm just papering, right? I'm just producing more paper, which is what gives me benefits for my career. So uh, I think there's a lot we can learn, right, from, from some of these approaches, from some of these communities that have quite the background and quite the battle wounds, you know, experimenting with these systems over time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, th I think there are a lot of challenges and like, to, to we definitely don't have the answers. <laughs> We're going to be figuring them out along, along the way. Uh, one thing that reminds me of is like, so, so in this circumstance, only attendees of the conference are able to vote. So there's kind of like an expertise barrier um yeah yep. built in yes. that's that's pretty cool I, i'll definitely read that paper and look into it more one thing um that we're building currently is like um a way to determine people's reputation so we have this like academic verification feature where in theory you can claim your uh like publication history based on orchid or uh, linkedin um and in theory, like over time, we'll build the ability to um, maybe gate the ability to respond to a peer review based on having demonstrated the required expertise to like basically know what you're talking about. And so even that's not perfect because like you said, there are like weird professional incentives, like even in academia currently, people who are experts but highly invested in a theory may not be super open to new theories so like there's still going to be you know more iteration that needs to be done on top of this but yeah I think like gating things where only people who know what they're talking about are allowed to discuss it um in a in a public setting you know with high visibility uh ma makes a lot of sense yeah I think so too. I think there's, there's um, one of the approach we've been thinking about is, um, hey, imagine if you could target specific people. Like, first of all, can you find people, right? This is the first question is like, who within the space of all possible scientists would be most competent to be able to appraise a piece of work? And by the way, Patrick, if this is something you want to work on with us, we could totally collaborate on that. And I think we talked about it. Yeah. And, you know, you make like a peer review recommendation system. Take open Alex, you embed a bunch of papers, you create uh, similarity scores, you allow to rise, right? The people that are most, that have similar work in the past, 
right? That are therefore you would assume to be, you know, somewhat competent around these, these topics. And then you create a way to like, you know, gate the reviews to a certain cutoff point where all these people would be invited to reviews and others uh, just wouldn't make the cut, right? Because at the end of the day, um, what is tragic is excluding someone who could be competent, right? I think that's the, that's the type of error you, you want to avoid. But there's a point where if you put your threshold too low, the utility for the entire group goes down because of spam and opportunistic reviewers, right? So it's just about finding that right balance. Yeah, Ronan, you wanted to intervene. Yeah, I, I really like that idea of the a recommendation for reviewers. Um, I was kind of thinking, you know, as you we as we guys were talking, you know, I was looking at the paper you shared, uh, Chris, about this kind of motivations for peer review. And it feels like there's also, there's this aspect of peer review, like it feels like it's almost worth a kind of alternate framing of peer review. It's something like, it's not just people trying to shoot down your work. It's actually, we're trying to do better, create better knowledge together. So it's about, if you're, if you're, if I'm submitting a paper and I know that there's a system out there that's going to go and connect me now with people that like have skin in the game or are really interested in what I'm doing, I can talk to them and maybe they'll have critical you know, comments for my work, or maybe they'll be interested in collaborating with me, but it's a whole different game. It feels like it's not just like these random people that got selected, they're tired. They don't really want to do any review and they're just kind of, you know, doing it for the money. Yeah. So I, I think a hundred percent, and I think this was the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of peer review for who, right? Important question. Are you peer reviewing for the editor of nature or are you peer reviewing for the authors? Right. right? Yeah. It's a very sense. important question, right? Who are you peer reviewing for? Um, if you're like, as a scientist, if I get a peer review request from a certain journal, I know just about how I need to conduct that peer review and what I need to look for. I know that if it's for a glamour journal, you have to pay attention to the novelty factor, to the Delta knowledge on top of, you know, paying attention to the solidity and the innovativeness of the methods, right? You want it all, but just weakness on any of these sides could lead to a negative review, right? Whereas if you're peer reviewing for plus, you're just like, okay, did he do his math right? Do the statistics add up and do the conclusions logically derived from the results, right? So it's just soundness, right? And if I peer review for a colleague, what is that? Is that really peer review? Because I'm not gating his work. I'm giving the person feedback on how to make it better, right? And I think these, these are like, it it's, could be super useful to kind of break these down. Imagine if you could have a draft or, or a preprint and the explicit instruction is not, you know, imagine you're peer reviewing for Nature's editor, right? The explicit instruction is help me out point out the problems. I want to make this better. I don't have a lot of time. You know, I'm, I have a ton of things to do. I'm looking for feedback from experts. It's constructive feedback. And I think it ties into some of the experience I've had submitting papers, which is there's reviewer one. It's the guy who just finds your works the best. You know, it's extraordinary. He's like, yeah, I, I love it. You know, here are a couple of minor comments, you know, move on, right? He's He just loves it. He's sold. Reviewer two is the person who typically shoots you down, right? He's like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen this year. And here's why, right? <laughs> and then reviewer three is the person who like sits down with your work. And for reasons that befuddle the mind, spends six hours giving you like this ultra detailed, broken down peer review of how to take your average paper and to turn it into a great paper, Right. And it's all, it's as if all of these people were responding to different things out of the request, right? And the question at the end of the day for me is like, how do I get more of peer reviewer three, right? I think that's really, and, and, and more than that, I was looking at peer reviewer three and I'm like, you know what? He actually did more work than author number five on that paper, right? Which raises another interesting question, right? It's like, well, this peer reviewer could almost be an author. So, so yeah, I think, I think here this kind of like brings us to a, 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 a point where it's really worth thinking about who the peer review is for, right? Uh, it's also different whether it's for the general public, right? Because like, does the are the conclusions supported by the data as the question of the general public, right? The question of the author is like, how can my work be better, right? Totally. Yeah. So this is a great point. A lot, a lot of important things to touch on. I think from those comments. Um, who the peer review is for, though, is a very good point. Where what you're describing, the world where, like, um, just a little bit of context. I, you know, Chris was extremely hospitable and hosted me um at his house maybe like a couple weeks ago. And one thing that I told him about that I'd like to start doing within the DSI industry is basically like um, get, getting people together for dinners, 
where we just all sit down and pick one of our projects and we just collectively tear it apart. And like, we just point out all the flaws and help have like a look in the mirror moment, you know, for whoever's project it is to like point out things that could be improved where like the goal of that exercise would be, you know, that peer review is for the founding team to help them create a better product. And, and I think like, that's what the perfect world of peer review for science should be is like, Hey, we're all in this industry together. We're trying to create the best world we can. And so let's give like constructive criticism. I think could be a little bit too nice, but like criticism that is constructive, you know, to the person creating the initial content. And so, so in my mind, that's like the perfect ideal world that we would like to move towards who are peer reviews for at the moment. Like when you like submit, you know, to a journal and you get peer reviews, like, why do you go through the process? Like, what's the point? And like, my understanding is unfortunately it's about publications. Like you just want to get published. So that way you can have the line on your resume. So that way you can get a good postdoc. So that way you can get some more publications. So that way you can get a professorship, eventually get some grants. So like right now, peer reviews are not necessarily like exactly that idealistic world where it's like, you know, criticism that is constructive on the initial piece of work for the goal of improving the world. It's more criticism that is required from a gatekeeper in order to justify publication within a gatekeeper. And so... Yeah. Yeah, and I think get access to resources, right? That's exactly. That's cool. yeah, and ultimately definitely. serve funders of science, right? Totally. Because funders of science have a big pot of money and they have to allocate it, right? And that's the allocative problem. It's a very hard problem for them to solve, right? Totally. And uh, we could argue like the function of peer review is, you know, as a as a tool to guide and direct, right? This 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 pot of money. So so the peer review for who? It's you're, you're not peer reviewed for a scientist. Peer reviewed for the purpose of allocative decisions that are made down the line, right? Exactly. And, and, and I think like from the context of the perspective of a startup that's looking for product market fit, like our peer reviews on Research Hub, we'd like them to be used in a way that helps scientists get published in journals. They're really like for journals at the current moment, you could say, because that's the way that we can create value within the current economic structure of science. If we're able to like get our hooks in and find traction and sustainability through this value prop, we can then use financial incentives to maybe help to tweak the culture towards something that's more, you know, like critically constructive towards building a better world. So yeah, long-winded way of saying like, we have to plug into the current incentive structure. And if we find traction, we'll be able to help use financial incentives to improve things for the better, hopefully. And I'm completely with you on this, right? I'm completely on you, you with this. I think the role is really to help scientists get published, right? Where, where they want and uh, to create a better scientific record and, and to actually ultimately help their careers because this is the only way, right? <laughs> we succeed in this. It is the only way. Um, but it, it, it raises a lot of really interesting points. Another argument against paying peer reviewer that you hear a lot is the fear of opening Pandora's box if tomorrow a big publisher, a volume-based publisher says, paid peer reviews, $200, right? APCs go up, it's now 4K. It's not 2.5K, right? What happens? What happens? What, hap what about the others? What about those that don't do it, right? Um, is this going to lead immediately to, the, uh, um, to having financial norms completely uh, uh, replace social reciprocity norms, right? Pro-social motives, or like a sense of duty and responsibility towards your profession is gonna be subsumed and replaced by financial transaction. And this could have catastrophic consequences, right? According to, to, to this Pandora back box theory, right? Um, so I'm kind of curious your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I, I think like there's sort of two ways that I'd like to address this question. The first is like, financial incentives are a Pandora's box. Like, I think this fear is real and like, we have to be extremely intentional in how, like, not only we set up incentives, like million coin giveaway, bad idea was not, you know, well-constructed beforehand. There were bad, you know, results <laughs> from that, right? Like there is a risk of creating like, like viable 
like perverse incentives, you know, with token rewards. And we have to be consciously thinking of like how not to do that. And then always like being critical about ourselves, you know, are we currently doing it and how can we improve it? Um, so, yeah, I think that's a pretty important thing. Um, what I would disagree with though, with the like, theory that it will increase APCs and then just make it like more of a financial transaction in order to publish science. Like we can get peer reviews, like three peer reviews on research hub for a total of like, I don't know, like $500, you know, of like initial capital. And then that's the entire publishing cost. Like there's no need for like typesetting or like, you know, any of this other kind of like maybe unnecessary stuff that journals do. And so it, it goes back to the initial point where I think like kind of the organizations, like traditional academic journals are set up in a very like pre-internet fashion where there's a lot of bloat and a lot of waste and like they could be restructured to like provide these services where peer reviewers, the people who are creating the value in the publishing process are receiving compensation for the value they create rather than like kind of bloated old school things that don't really matter receiving value from people who are creating content for free. So, so yeah, I would push back that I think like these organizations could be designed in a way where the APCs actually get reduced through this process. Yeah. So I think that's a great topic for a, a next upcoming seminar, right? So I think this is a topic in itself is like within the pot of money, right? Because nothing is for free, right? There's always time and people and costs involved into everything, right? So it's, it's the question of like, you know, what, what, what is within all of the things, all of the functions of a journal and a publisher, what, what could be cut out and what could be new costs of source, uh, new sources of costs, right? Like paying peer reviewers, right? Um, but I think to be, to be fair to the Pandora's box argument, there's also another point. It's like, okay, imagine even if this pays for itself because there's a magic fairy that comes in, gives the money, right? What happens? to how people evaluate the effort they invest in the peer review, right? What happens? Is there, because it seems, you know, quite the case that the moment you propose a certain price, well, people will say, no, my time is not worth $100, $200, okay? Just to begin with, right? So you can expect bargaining behavior, right? To start happening. The moment you pull, you like un unlock the seal, right? Because now it's just transactional. Another thing you could expect is that for a given price, there's going to be standard of service expected, right? And because there's a standard of service and someone has to release the money at the other end, someone has to verify that the standard of service has been reached, right? Which adds overhead, right? So I think this is also like a, a kind of source of the fear, right? And I think understanding how, like one of the ideas we had uh, um, around that uh, would be to say, how can we create a system in which peer reviewers are paid or that there's value that is captured by peer reviewers, right? Or in a way that does not create transact, like it does not like create like a direct transactional relationship with its overhead and with its risk of creating monitoring costs that can go out of hand, right? One of the things we've been thinking about is like, imagine you tell PIs or like, uh, you know, science is very qualified, right? You say, hey, uh, uh, you, you don't get paid directly for peer review, but it contributes to a box, a pool, a pot. And that's pot, that pot is there to help your students either get like a small stipend or travel grants, right? So now all of a, all of a sudden you're a PI and you're like, oh, I could get travel grants and stipends for my PhD students. I have no tool in the entire world to increase their salaries, right? Because everything is fixed by a bureaucracy that's extremely rigid, right? So could it be that this would now, now you're creating a second pro-social incentive. It's not for me. I'm not the one getting paid, but I'm recapturing the value. And through that value, I'm creating a, 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 a utility for the people that work with me, right? That or on which I have very few other tools to help them. Yeah, I love it. And like, I think you used a very important word there with utility, where kind of like we're thinking of financial transactions um, like here's $200 for your peer review. It's a little bit different when it's saying, Hey, here's 300 token for your peer review, because what do you spend dollars on, you know, versus what do you spend tokens on? 
um, like on Research Hub, we're building an ecosystem of like lots of different ways to spend your token. So maybe you can stake it and get access to like a reference manager, or you know maybe you earn it from uh, doing peer reviews on other preprints. And once you've collected five hundred dollars worth, you can spend it. You know, asking others to do a peer review on your preprint. So like there is like a you know I think kind of like delicate distinction between like a direct financial transaction versus a token based transaction where with the token economy you can basically accomplish what you just described where you know maybe if you earn tokens for conducting a peer review and you have a certain amount you can get you know a free admission to your academic society's conference or something like that and so yeah i think that the design space is large where um, it can be more like you're paying into by conducting a peer review, like the pot of value created by science and you're allocated some of that value to then use for your own purposes. Like maybe you need a reagent for your next experiment. So you do a peer review that allows you to afford that next reagent. That's, I, I think, kind of the big picture, what we're going for with Research Hub is we don't want to have people earn $200 for peer review and then immediately go spend that on like, you know, a beer and dinner, right? Like they can do that if they want to, but we want to make it even easier for them to reinvest it back into the scientific economy in order to encourage others to do stuff that's actually helpful for them. So again, this is very high level and like hand wavy because it's going to be way harder to do in practice. There are going to be a lot of people who do the wrong thing and we're going to have to adjust on the fly. But yeah, I think what you're describing is kind of how we'd like you know, to see research coin within our product is more of like, um, like, do you guys have Chuck E. Cheese in, uh, not in Switzerland? No, not in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, it's like you play games, you earn tickets, you get prizes, right? And kind of like that sort of economy where nobody's, you know, if people want to trade you dollars for your Chuck E. Cheese, you know, tokens, you know, good for them. But the whole point is that you can spend yeah. them within Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, no, I think that 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 that's actually an interesting argument in favor of saying let's not just do a PayPal integration, right? It's an interesting argument in favor of that, which is a, a usually quite a, a difficult argument to counter on many level, right? So um, I, I do think that there is indeed uh, um, it, the moment there's the, the the affordances of the application and the systems and platforms and protocol, right, nudge you towards. Uh, reinvesting for your own scientific utility, I think now you now you're onto something, right? Um, so, uh, which which brings me to like the, another point, which is the argument against this Pandora's box, right? Another one. It's like actually some reviewers do get paid, right? Reviewers for grant agencies they get paid, like when you review for grants for large grant agencies, you are getting paid. Um, Reviews for certain highly super selective journal, like the American Economic Review, which is the flagship journal of all of economics, right? Uh, it's one of the top four, right? The journals that matter, make or break a career. You get paid $100, right? For conducting your peer review in a timely fashion. So it does happen. It does happen. And actually, this, they, had, they, were, they had data showing that their reviewers respond really well to incentives. But you could say, well, they're economists. So of course, right? It's funny. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know the the American Economic Review they they levy a submission tax. Why? Because they don't want to get spam. They don't want to get like tons of manuscripts and like just because their editor like their they, they really take their journal seriously, right? So their editor is like a, usually like a top most expert in the world, right? And he reads all of these manuscripts one by one. <laughs> it's a it's a tremendous amount of effort that's invested into that. They cannot afford spam. They cannot run a plus like operation that where editors get, you know, there's a lot of just things that should not go in there in the first place. So they have a submission fee. And guess what? If you get rejected, you don't get you get half of it, half of it back, right? Or something like that, right? You just get a portion back. And with all the rejections, they fund the peer reviewers, right? So every time they reject people, and they do reject a lot of people, actually, it's like one of those most ultra selective journals, right? So they're a rejection machine. And because they're a rejection machine, they do accumulate quite a pot that they use to pay their reviewers. And it works, right? That's an interesting case of like, 
you know, actual economists coming together, setting up a system to pay their reviewers and to incentivize triage and prevent the spam of their of their journal and community and the precious time of their editor on the other side. Yeah, I like it. It's creative. It kind of reminds me of applying for medical school where I sent like 50 schools, a hundred bucks and they all rejected me except for one. <laughs> so like, I think, I think like that's been done. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember you mentioning that, you know, when we hung out in person and I think that's a pretty creative and delicate mechanism that we could definitely learn from it would be worth exploring. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think it's a fascinating topic. There's so much to talk about. I'm super stoked about what you're doing. I'm happy to see that it's taking off. Uh, it, I think it's it's uh, it's one of the greatest experiences in the space, and I really I'm we're super looking forward to like see how this evolves, and uh, also all the other experiments you're going to be testing out in the long run. Because I think Research Hub, perhaps the name is mischosen. It should be like something about sandboxing new possible systems, right? With incentives like science site sandbox, you know, or, or or something like that, where we can really test out, you know all of that, that incentive space. So I think it's really cool, Patrick. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And uh, we should have another seminar talking about what are the functions that journal perform today in publishers, right? What are the essential ones? What are the ones that could be cut out? What are the sources of costs? And if we can cut out costs, how could we reinvest some of the, 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 the cost structures into other forms of services, right? And I think it'll lead us to interesting conversations around, well, we should start checking if the data is open, right? And provide attestations around that. We should check if things are reproducible. We should do a lot of like other types of services around that curation process. And so I think that's gonna lead to like some really fascinating conversations too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And um, again, like I think uh, like, uh, criticism that is constructive is the best thing possible. So like if anybody who's listening to this sees something in Research Hub that like bothers them or they think is like not going to work, like please reach out and tell us. Um, so that way we can like take your opinion, you know, into account and try and iterate in like the most, I think, like informed manner possible. Uh, one other, if, if I have another minute or two, one, one other thing that I just want to mention that like has been, I think, like the most valuable part of adding a token incentive into Research Hub is that like we do have a core of like extremely bright, talented, like motivated by the problem scientists who are helping us build the product. And like, as I mentioned earlier, doing like most of the really hard startup work. And so um, tokens have like aligned incentives in a way where there are people who are like smarter than me, have like more experience with the problems than I do, like who are like telling us how to build our product in a way that we never could as like an organization independently. And so, um, yeah, we've just been very lucky to have like that type of like support and energy from like our customer base is like the wrong term. Like it's like our community user, like co-builders. Um, but yeah, I think part of their motivation for spending so much time on Research Hub, especially when the token was completely unknown, is because they have this like shared vision for the future of this like problem that they experience. And so, yeah, I, I like um, the number one benefit of tokenizing hasn't even been like, you know, like actions on the website and getting people to do stuff because of financial incentives. It's like getting passionate people who care about the problem to help us build a solution. So yeah, if anybody has criticism for us, um, I'm at joysticks on uh, X. So please like reach out to me and like tell us where we suck because like we would like to improve and criticism is the best thing possible. So thank you. Yeah, great closing words. There's nothing I can add to this. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for coming on to the seminar and looking forward to the next one next week. Yeah, this was a blast. Thank you all.